Okay, so uh, first of all, I want to get an idea of how many of you have already played with TensorFlow. Okay, great. Um, okay, so we open sourced TensorFlow on Spark back in February of this year. So I'll be covering uh, kind of like the highlights of what it is and how it works. Uh, and then I'll cover a little bit of uh, what we've been doing since then. So what is it specifically? It's literally the ability to run your TensorFlow applications on top of your Spark cluster. Um, it's been interesting watching all the other talks today. Uh, it's exciting that there's all sorts of uh, innovation going on in making deep learning uh, more approachable. Uh, our particular take on it is to literally kind of uh, be as simple as possible, let you just run TensorFlow in its uh, current state as much as possible. Uh, why did we work on it? So obviously Yahoo has been a major supporter of open source in the past from uh, open sourcing Hadoop way back when uh, to uh, my co-speaker uh, speaking at the original Spark Summit uh, back in 2013. Uh, and most recently our team has open sourced uh, Cafe on Spark in a very similar manner. Um, because of this, uh, at Yahoo we have a lot of production clusters, uh, tens of clusters, each one with thousands of nodes and petabytes of data. So we really want to have access to all that hardware and data from TensorFlow. Okay, so without TensorFlow on Spark, this is pretty much what you would end up with. Uh, you would have a production Hadoop Spark cluster on the right, uh, getting data from wherever your, your feeds are coming from. Uh, and most people would have built a custom deep learning cluster on the side, uh, standing up either TensorFlow or Cafe or whatnot. Um, you would end up preparing your data sets on the Hadoop cluster, like most likely in Spark. Uh, you would end up having to copy that data off your cluster into wherever your deep learning grid is or your deep learning cluster is, do your experiments, do your training, and then uh, when you're happy, you would end up trying to copy this model back to your production cluster so you could try and use it there. Obviously, that's not ideal. So what we want to do is literally put the TensorFlow learning and the inference uh, right on top of Spark. And uh, one of the nice things about this is we can integrate it with any other uh, existing data pipeline tools that you might have, like MLlib or Spark SQL. Okay, so this is from our blog post back in February. Uh, it is a benchmark of running the Inception Image Recognition Network uh, that was published by the TensorFlow team. Uh, and basically what it demonstrates is as you scale up the workers in the Spark yarn side, uh, you get essentially linear scaling. Uh, you'll see that the uh, one worker case takes something like 45, 48 hours. You double that, you end up at 22 hours and so on and so forth. Um, one of the reasons we wanted to do this benchmark and, and prove it out there is that uh, this is actually a characteristic of TensorFlow in general. Uh, and we're just trying to prove that by adding TensorFlow and Spark, uh, you're not taking a huge hit or anything like that. Okay, and then uh, as part of our original open source, uh, we actually added a patch to TensorFlow for RDMA over InfiniBand uh, as opposed to uh, gRPC over Ethernet. And this benchmark, uh, we, we, I don't think we published it, but we're talking about it. Uh, it demonstrates that for network heavy uh, deep learning architectures, uh, you can get significant gains by going to RDMA and InfiniBed, uh, basically 2.4x faster. Um, and then the, our friends over at Mellanox uh, did an independent uh, benchmark of the same code, and they found similarly it was more than 2x faster. Okay, so these are the main design goals uh, that we set out to, to meet when we built this thing. Uh, we wanted to, like I said before, take your existing TensorFlow apps and uh, deploy them onto your grid with very minimal changes. We wanted to, essentially by doing uh, minimal changes, we wanted to also support whatever existing functionality existed in that version of TensorFlow at that time. Um, we don't want to get into the business of, you know, uh, 
burrowing into the, the low-level APIs and changing out uh, everything so that it's uh, too custom. So as, uh, by doing that, we get uh, basically default support for TensorFlow's synchronous and asynchronous training. Uh, we get model data parallelism, and we get uh, essentially TensorBoard support for free. Um, and then uh, the beauty of it all, what we really wanted to achieve is, again, to in integrate this with all of our existing HDFS uh, pipelines. Okay, so more into the details of what it actually is. Um, it's almost literally a PySpark application wrapper of your TensorFlow code. Um, if you've played with TensorFlow before, you typically have something that looks like a main function that defines your uh, operation graph, uh, and then there might be a little loop to, to kick off the training. So we literally wrap that main function into a Spark map partitions function, uh, and then let you launch the cluster uh, using Spark. Um, in addition, we added support for uh, feed dictionaries. If you've played with TensorFlow, uh, you've probably seen the MNES example where they iterate over the data in a feed dictionary. Um, in a Spark world, uh, if you have a data set that is larger than memory, uh, it becomes a little bit challenging to do a feed dictionary. So we've provided the capability to uh, send data from an RDD however large it may be, uh, and, and map partition the data into your uh, TensorFlow node. And then finally, uh, well not finally, the TensorFlow itself actually supports reading from HDFS. Uh, and so there are modes in which you can read the data directly from HDFS uh, in this system. Again, like I said, it supports TensorBoard, both during training and also after. And again, one of the key points is trying to be generally agnostic to Spark or TensorFlow versions. Okay, so there you go. We've tested with these versions. This is the high-level overview. Uh, it's very similar to Spark. Uh, generally, the driver distributes uh, compute tasks to the executors. In this case, our compute task just so happens to be your TensorFlow application and or a parameter server. Okay, uh, the basics, we actually launch the cluster. Uh, for certain modes, we'll allow you to feed data into the TensorFlow app via the feed dictionary, and then we provide a simple API to shut down the cluster. So uh, this is an example of using our API. Uh, like I said, we're trying to make a very minimal API just to kind of launch the cluster, uh, allow you to feed data to the, your TensorFlow nodes, and allow you to shut down the, the cluster. Uh, for the TensorFlow run API, the parameters are your Spark contacts, your TensorFlow main function, essentially, the arguments that you normally would have passed to your TensorFlow main function, uh, the number of executors in your cluster that you want to be running TensorFlow nodes on, the number of those that you want to be running the TensorFlow parameter servers on, and then uh, whether or not you want to launch a TensorFlow server or TensorBoard server, and whether or not you want to use the different input mode uh, of the Spark RDD or the TensorFlow QRunner. Okay, so this is a actual diff of uh, a little image classifier evaluation tool that we converted from a plain TensorFlow application to TensorFlow and Spark. You can see that most of it is boilerplate for making a PySpark application. Uh, we changed the main function into this uh, function signature that takes uh, your, your command line arguments and this context object that we use. Uh, and then you literally just uh, start your cluster inside Spark. Okay. All right, now I wanna get into a little bit more about the different, uh, the two different input modes uh, because this comes, uh, comes up quite a bit when we talk to our customers. Um, the first mode, like I said, Spark is in control it is reading from HDFS using RDD map partitions, and then it is feeding it into your TensorFlow app. Uh, TensorFlow itself is reading it directly. And this is kind of how it works. So in the Spark mode, uh, TensorFlow generally has a Python worker to execute Python tasks. We will actually launch the TensorFlow nodes into the workers. 
The parameter server nodes are a little bit special because they will sit there and run and block further tasks from arriving on the node. The TensorFlow workers themselves will be started on a background task uh, along with a queue, which frees up the Python workers for a uh, map partitions call to feed data. So um, once the worker, once all the t TensorFlow nodes are put together, are started, uh, they will actually communicate to each other via TensorFlow standard uh, distributed cluster spec. Then we'll do our RDD map partitions. Each partition will get it be inserted into a queue. The queue will be read from your TensorFlow feed dictionary call uh, whenever TensorFlow is ready for new data. So in the TensorFlow mode, Almost the same thing, except now we launch everything just in the foreground process. TensorFlow is in control here. Uh, your workers will connect together, form the cluster, and then your workers will read directly from HDFS. So it's, uh, it's almost literally like just starting up uh, TensorFlow on nodes that happen to be in your cluster. Okay. So that all said, uh, I want to talk about failure recovery. So obviously, in TensorFlow, checkpoints are critical. Uh, it's highly recommended that you checkpoint uh, regularly uh, because you don't want to be two days into training and then have a node failure. Um, that said, with, there's a difference in the way that Spark and TensorFlow modes uh, handle failures because of the architecture that I showed before. Uh, in the Spark mode, that TensorFlow node is actually running in the background. So Spark has no visibility of any errors happening there. Uh, instead, it has visibility of the data feeding job, uh, which is pushing data to your TensorFlow node. So if you happen to have a temporary glitch on a partition, uh, Spark would retry that and feed it back to your TensorFlow node. The other mode, uh, everything's running in the foreground. So in this case, your TensorFlow application actually has to have a failure and, and actually has to like throw an exception uh, in order for Spark to retry it as a task. Generally, this is uh, less frequent. It's mostly during development stage that you'll see this kind of behavior. Okay. Um, the other big problem that we have with this current system is that if you lose an executor, uh, in this system, not just the task, but the entire executor, it becomes a problem. Uh, most likely because sp uh, Yarn does not necessarily respawn your executor on the same host and the same uh, node. And because the TensorFlow cluster spec is currently fixed, it's actually statically defined when you start up your TensorFlow nodes, you have to tell each of the nodes where everybody else is. Uh, it's kind of a challenge in a dynamic environment where Yarn is spawning uh, executors left and right. So, sorry. So, yes, we're currently exploring options with the TensorFlow team, TBD. Okay, so uh, these are just simple screen caps from uh, an MNIST job just to prove that we could do it. Um, and I wanted to briefly talk about the kind of phases of development that we've seen at Yahoo. Um, generally, people or researchers will start on a single node with small scale data, prototyping algorithms, prototyping you know, hyperparameters, what, whatever it may be. Uh, you'll start with these simple TensorFlow APIs, uh, graph session and interactive session. And then you'll get to a point where everything looks good and you think you want to scale, because uh, as we've all known, scaling is good for, for big data um, and for machine learning. So generally, uh, what we've seen is the researchers would stand up a little private cluster of a couple nodes. They would copy more data. They would still be constrained to you know, copying data around uh, and constrained to the size of a local physical disk. Um, but at least they can start playing with distributed TensorFlow, uh, modifying their code a, a little bit to, to handle things like cluster specs and servers. But then finally, you want to get this thing to production. Uh, and that's kind of where we step in with our TensorFlow and Spark. Uh, it allows you to take that code that you wrote for the, your private cluster and with a couple lines of code change, uh, enable it to run inside your, your actual production cluster with uh, with production data and 
production inferencing with TensorFlow serving. So um, we have some examples on our GitHub repo for converting an existing TensorFlow distributed application over to TensorFlow and Spark, uh, just to kind of give you an idea of what's involved. I don't have time, unfortunately, to cover that, but I invite you guys to take a look. Um, other common gotchas. So if you recall the pictures of the different modes, one of the things we assume right now is that there's a single task per executor. And I know a lot of people like to spawn whatever, 20 tasks per executor. Um, in this particular case, we, we chose to use this model just to simplify kind of the mental model. Um, and the, the most visible outcome of this is that your Spark executor log is literally your TensorFlow application, uh, that nodes log. And so if you have three executors, you would have three TensorFlow nodes and clean logs for each one of those, okay? Uh, the other gotcha that we've seen is, uh, like I said, TensorFlow natively supports access to HDFS, but it actually only supports that through various jars, libraries uh, that may be present on your environment. If you have a non-standard location for Hadoop and, and various libraries, we've seen that trip up people. And then finally, uh, I get this question a lot is, you know, I have this algorithm, I convert it to TensorFlow and Spark, how come it doesn't scale linearly, like your nice graph? Uh, it's kind of more of a challenge to kind of cover than the time I have today. Um, but the, at the highest level, uh, the, the simplest way to think about it is if your application is not stressing out your local single node, um, it's highly unlikely that adding 10 more nodes is gonna make that any better. Um, so what you really want is something that is really uh, meaty, shall we say, for, for your single node application. Uh, something that is either spinning you know, your, your compute or tying up all your memory, uh, things like that. Um, and if your algorithm runs in, let's say, a couple seconds to a couple minutes, once again, adding a thousand nodes all spawning on yarn probably isn't gonna make that faster. Okay? Ah, so what's new? What have we done since February? So obviously, uh, since we opened source, we've had some community contributions. Uh, there's one big one where uh, the original source was not quite, or the original instructions weren't quite compatible with CDH, so uh, there was a contributor who uh, helped us out there. We've uh, kind of cleaned up or refactored the TensorFlow side API for dealing with these feed dictionaries. Again, that was mostly to clean up some of the uh, boundary cases and then obviously uh, fixing bugs along the way. Uh, RDMA, the original patch that we had submitted is now actually merged into the TensorFlow mainline under the contrib directory. Uh, so hopefully that'll come out, I think in one, two or one, three. Um, we've changed the way that we create our cluster spec in the beginning. Um, before we just did a simple kind of map partitions and collect of hosts and ports, which wasn't quite as reliable. Now this is a better, more reliable system. And the nice thing about having a registration server is if you recall the problem with dynamic cluster management, we could potentially tie in, into this thing. Uh, we've added support for Spark streaming. Uh, one of the Good things about using Spark, uh, as, as technologies evolve and as they support these things near seamlessly, we can support them near seamlessly as well. And finally, uh, we've added PIP packaging, and I'll talk a little bit about these last two. So Spark streaming, most of you guys already know, but this is essentially the lines of code changes required to go from a standard batch model to a streaming model. Uh, most of it is, again, boilerplate for importing streaming context uh, or, or reading uh, a stream instead of an RDD or writing a stream versus an RDD and otherwise it's fairly simple. And then uh, the PIP package. So with the PIP packaging, uh, before, if you see that red line, we used to ask the users to check out our repo build this zip file, ship it to all the executors via the dash dash archives. Now, um, if you, uh, for, for something like the Spark standalone mode, uh, if you control your Python distribution across all your nodes, you can just pip install TensorFlow on Spark and those 
those uh, cluster launch APIs will be available to you. Okay, so where are we headed next? Um, this first bullet item has been here for a while. Um, we've been tracking the uh, TensorFlow high-level APIs. Uh, they are moving towards Keras, but they also support the TF contrib layers. Uh, we have some, we have a, a demo, sort of, of MNIST on Keras on our repo. It's on our branch right now, uh, mostly because it seems like this API is still evolving as we speak, so I don't want to commit to something until TensorFlow commits. Um, and like I said, failure recovery with dynamic cluster management. Um, like I said, with that registration server, we might be able to tell all the other nodes that this node went down, and oh, by the way, here's his new address. Okay, so uh, in summary, TensorFlow on Spark uh, brings deep learning uh, in TensorFlow to big data clusters. Uh, we support all the different versions of TensorFlow and Spark. Uh, we support whatever uh, Spark supports for cluster management, for the most part. Um, we have an EC2 image available, and RDMA is now in TensorFlow. Uh, I'd like to thank, obviously, Hadoop and Spark teams for building awesome distributed platforms that we can all leverage. Uh, obviously, I want to thank TensorFlow for a, a very useful tool for deep learning. Uh, thank Yahoo for letting us work on cool stuff and open sourcing stuff. And finally, our open source contributors. Any questions? Thank you. <clears throat> Give him a big hand to Lee. We have loads of time, eight minutes. Um, so there are two mics on either side. Can you mind, do you mind? The two mics on the aisle, please line up if you have any questions. The two mics on the aisle, do you mind? Hi, thank you. Uh, I want to ask, uh, uh, so which resource manager are you using? Using YAR or using Mesos or using standalone for your case? Um, for what we've tested with is we actually are using it with Yarn internally. Uh, you can actually use it with Spark standalone. Uh, we have instructions for standalone. I think we've played with Mesos a little bit um, to prove that it, that works as well. And we might look into Kubernetes in the future. Why you, why you prefer Yarn? I think uh, maybe Mesos is better for... <laughs> yes. <laughs> so uh, that's just, a, I think for us, it's mostly a byproduct of what we've been using internally. Uh, we've been on Yarn for a while. Oh, there, go ahead. Great job. Um, what's the big difference between what you're doing and stuff like uh, Big DL and the new deep learning stuff? In yeah, Spark? exactly. Like I said, it's, it was interesting to see all these talks uh, that are all kind of aligned in trying to democratize deep learning, especially on top of Spark. I would say that for our particular take on it, it's more of a TensorFlow perspective uh, is another way to think about it. I think the other tools want you to use their APIs for things like building a layer or, or building your optimizer, whereas here we're mostly just saying, let's start your TensorFlow cluster within your application, you're using TensorFlow APIs. So it's as close to native TensorFlow as we could make it, kind of, is another way to think about it. Okay. Um, whereas I think a lot of these other uh, platforms have different libraries. Okay, go ahead. Hi, congrats. I would like to know if TensorFlow supports graph visualizations, algorithms. Sorry, graph what algorithms? Graph visualizations, algorithms. Visualization Visualization. Algorithms. Um, I thought that TensorFlow itself had an embedding visualization in TensorBoard, but I haven't played with it that much myself. Okay. Um, and okay. I don't know if that quite fits what you're, what you're looking yep. for. Yep, that's okay. Thank you. Go ahead. So uh, I see a lot of concerns about the data movement, and some yes. of these solutions are, uh, are targeting to solve the problem of data movement. Right. But my question is that uh, deep learning is very expensive. Even if you look at the, the fastest GPUs, TensorFlow running on the fastest GPU, right. something like Cypher, they're processing like one millisecond per, per image, which translates to something like 
one megabyte a second, right. which is orders of magnitude slower than data movement. And I'm talking inference alone. So how much are, are we over? I mean, are we solving the, the right problem by trying to uh, put TensorFlow closer to the distributed system yeah. rather than keep them separate? OK. Yeah, that's a, actually an interesting question. And it's actually a valid question. So in most of deep learning, you're, in most cases, you're limited by a compute. Right? That's why people run GPUs. That's why people try and load everything in memory in most cases. Uh, one of the problems that we're trying to solve here is almost ancillary or outside of that, which is you have researchers in your company who want to build a deep learning model. There's petabytes of data over there. And do you want them copying snippets of data to laptops, other grids, other other nodes and having to cap copy them back and forth. It, it, it's almost like a human scale problem, mm -hmm. right? Um, especially if you're trying to train data where the data set arrives, let's say, uh, in some cadence. You know, and I'm a, I'm a researcher, and do I want to write a script that does an HDFS copy over to my training cluster once an hour or something like so that? So it's the operational cost of data movement, not it, not the time. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say that this solves, like, makes your TensorFlow run faster just because it happens to be there. Um, I, I think the one thing that you might benefit is, you know, you're, you're on the same uh, colo, right, the same physical machine a lot of times uh, as the data. So you might get some of this data locality, rack locality. Yeah. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, I'm curious if you guys have looked at all at the problem of getting, um, Yarn and TensorFlow on Yarn uh, to play nicely with GPUs. Yes, <laughs> we actually have. Uh, and in fact, we've been uh, in discussions. We have an internal uh, Hadoop team at Yahoo who are committers to Hadoop and Yarn. And we've had discussions with them. Okay. And at the highest level, it's, it's kind of a difficult problem. Uh, but it's also kind of a philosophical problem. Uh, they don't want to keep adding different characteristics of hardware that you all have to now juggle and manage as a resource. Um, and then at the same time, they don't, they want to, if they want to do that, they want to build a generalized model for different types of resources. And so it's in discussions, I think, uh, Intel or IBM, somebody was also, oh, Microsoft. Microsoft is also very interested in scheduling GPUs. So hopefully one day that will come. Uh, as if you've played with our instructions, you'll see that we actually use memory as a proxy uh, for GPU in our particular cluster. Um, so if you happen to have, let's say, eight GPUs on a node, we divide memory by eight, and that becomes your virtual proxy for a GPU. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Since I'm holding the mic, I might as well ask you one. Sure. Um, as a developer, a bubble pops up on my head. You say, how do you debug this thing? I mean, yeah. use printfs. Yeah. So, so I think it's, uh, there's a couple ways to debug. Uh, obviously, we have the nice logging capabilities of Spark. Uh, so you get the per node logs. Uh, but at the same time, if you're debugging your actual deep learning algorithm, TensorFlow is most likely your best way, um, especially something as simple as getting the chart of the loss at, during training. Uh, because a lot of times, if you mess up your, your uh, algorithm, you know, mm -hmm. the, the loss will not converge. OK, well, thank you. Give a big hand to Lee, then. Thank you.